We're here today with Emily Galagoski, who is with the Calming Technology Lab at Stanford. Uh, she's a researcher there, and although we are normally concerned with digital media and learning, this is an interesting project about learning about digital technology and its effect on our, our lives. I, I came across uh, Emily's uh, presence project recently, and uh, I thought it would be useful for for people who are struggling with how to how to deal with the distractions that are afforded by the the media that are available to us today, and to deal with that in in their family context. So, Emily, tell me uh, about the uh, the presence project. Absolutely. So thank you so much for, for having us on to talk about the project. Uh, this is basically an undertaking that started in Design Garage, which is a multidisciplinary course at the Stanford D School um, with product design students and then with myself, who um, has a master's in education. Um, and we really noticed that many of the people that we were interacting with in daily life seemed sort of distracted by their devices and unable to unplug. Um, and so a group of us got together and started we, we coined ourselves the Presence Project and started thinking through what would it look like to just introduce some mindfulness and some alternative ways of being uh, for people in their everyday lives. And we especially wanted to focus on families um, with young children. And the reason for sort of focusing on, on families with children about ages 4 to 10 is really the idea that maybe they're starting to learn health behaviors around digital devices for the first time. Uh, and so Kyle Williams, who's a mechanical engineering student and artist, and I sort of decided to move this project forward and introduce what we call Be Here Now boxes. And these are basically physical toolkits that have been rolled out to about 10 Bay Area families. And they basically just offer invitations for reconnection in an age of digital distraction. And I should mention, we're absolutely not anti-technology. That is not the point of this project. It really is all about inviting families to find alternative ways of interacting um, in a time when all of us are, are very apt to want to jump on our computers or jump on our phones during shared family time. And so there are about five components to the toolkit. Sort of the centerpiece of it um, is a cloud meter. And this is basically, it, it's a beautiful wooden box um, and it runs off of just a, a applet script. Um, and it's really intended as to be a tangible reminder uh, to sort of of the value of your time spent online. Um, so each family member gets a token with their initial on it. Um, those tokens are basically up for family discussion as to what, what is their value. Do they serve as a form of allowance? Um, what is the value of the time for each coin? So let's say that um, Howard had a couple of coins with an H on them. Those were each good for 15 minutes of internet time. And his family decided that at the end of the day, he was able to have one hour of internet time. Uh, he puts those coins into the meter, and when the coins are done, uh, the Wi-Fi on the computer basically disconnects. And so it's just really intended to be sort of an in-environment uh, way to help monitor your own internet usage and really prioritize your time spent online. Uh, some of the other things in the toolkit include an internet allowance agreement, uh, we've worked with the San Francisco-based startup Rescue Time to help give families basically some data and some tracking information about how their time is being spent on the internet. Um, we've worked with Drawdio, which is um, out of the MIT Media Lab um, and is a sort of neat, um, very tangible musical instrument making kit um, created by Jay Silver that we wanted to include in the kit. Um, and the, the toolkits have been well received. I mean, we, we tried to roll them out actually at the beginning of summer vacation and we realized that that was probably not the most ideal time just because families schedules are so in flux. Um, but really looking forward to working with families um, as their children start to go back to school now. So you're really getting started on observing what the effects of these boxes are on, on families. Absolutely. So we sort of put a hypothesis out into the world based on, we did about three months of 
what we call user need finding. Um, we, we use sort of a human-centered design or design thinking approach um, and really wanted to understand families where they're at and what are their everyday pain points and how might we as designers begin to introduce something that would be useful to them. Um, and, you know, the, the box is absolutely sort of a high-fidelity prototype and we're open to changing it based on what families tell us they need. Um, a few Bay Area schools have also asked if we can come and work with their families and so we may end up going the route of working with schools directly. Um, very much is still to be determined but our biggest, I guess the biggest question that we have now for families is what about this works and what doesn't? How can we change it for you? Anything else in the in the box uh, besides the, the cloud meter? Um, I think I saw a couple of other things, uh, other activities that people can do. Yep. So there's the the Dradio, which is the um, the music making piece. There is um, a phone dock, which we call like a phone bed, which is basically a place for your phones to get rest. Um, what we heard um, and what we saw from visiting Bay Area families was that um, many of them found their children were sending, you know, up to sixty text messages after they were, had been sent to bed at night. And so we thought, what does it look like? for families to have a sort of a shared space where the phones are docked. Um, and in many ways, we found that families are already hacking together these solutions. We saw handwritten agreements and um, wire bins in sort of public spaces in the home, in the kitchen and the like, um, and really just wanted to, to figure out how it is that we might start to formalize um, these tools for families. So, um Hopefully, when you get results from this, if they're positive, you will be rolling out more of these, and and the, the prototype will maybe turn into something a, a larger at a larger scale. We hope so. You know, it's it's really interesting to see where interest has come from. Um, people in the medical field are interested in in sort of considering what might this look like from a behavior modification perspective. Um, some people have advised us to actually start working with family therapists, especially in Silicon Valley, where um, you know oftentimes one member of the family works um, works in technology and often sort of finds themselves taking a do as I say, not as I do approach. Um, with with their children so absolutely looking to continue the program um, and really just grateful for the families who have invited us into their homes and lives well given the relatively small samples so far do you have any words of wisdom to to families about approaching dealing with the issues around attention and technology Absolutely. So I think the, the biggest thing that we've observed in working um, on this project for the past year is it all starts with a discussion among family members. And sometimes this is fraught with difficulty and even getting the kids to sit down and really have a discussion. Um, but I think that finding ways for the kids to feel brought in. With the cloud meter, we really conceived of it as something that the parents didn't just manage. Um, we wanted it to be something where the kids also felt an onus for making the program work and for all also um, sort of, I guess, um, helping their parents be accountable. So I think as much as families can have an open discussion that feels reciprocal, I think that is absolutely the first, the first start to, uh, to it, basically just interesting, introducing some new behaviors. Can you tell us uh, in closing just a little bit about the, the Common Technology Lab in, in general? Absolutely. Um, so the lab was started um, by Nima Muraveji, uh, who is has a doctorate in the School of Education at Stanford. Um, he had worked with BJ Fogg, who is a behavior designer um, and, and health change designer, um, and sort of realized that there was an, a real opportunity for um, designers to start thinking about how cognitive and physical calm might actually be introduced into the devices that we use. Um, and so for me, I, I think of this oftentimes as the devices that we carry with us every day oftentimes introduce arousal into our physical lives. We find ourselves responding to them and being taken out of them the moment. And actually, what might it look like if we tried to introduce experiences that were more based on meeting people where they're at and really getting them to focus? Um, and so in the spring, we 
uh, taught a class with Dr. Steph Habeth um, and Gus Tai from Trinity Ventures, um, along with Roy P. from the School of Education called D. Compress, decompress, um, designing calming technology at the D school. And we ended up launching sort of this whole new generation of uh, calming technologists and people who are now thinking about how do I introduce this experience of calm and well being into everyday technology experiences? Well, I, I think it's appropriate that Stanford, where so much technology has originated, ought to explore ways to deal with how technology is shaping our lives and how we can shape technologies. I think you're spot on, absolutely. And both with Presence Project and with the Calming Technology Lab, we're not necessarily conceiving that people throw away their devices and go meditate on a mountain. That's not that's not what we're trying to put into the world. We really are saying, where is their meeting point between being connected and and sort of being well and being alert? Excellent. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you, Howard.